Welcome to the Morning Tempo Podcast. I'm your host, Robonzo. In case you missed it in the last episode, yes, I am now Robonzo, but you can still call me um, Roberto. But uh, yeah, go back an episode and you can hear the quick story about that in the intro. Christina Zhao, my guest, is chief mistress at the Sichuan House of San Antonio, Texas. I don't know if that's her real title, but that's what she calls herself on Instagram, and I love her Instagram, so I went with it. I've been dying to have some restaurant tours on this podcast because my wife and I found ourselves in the restaurant business last year. What a great time to foray into the restaurant business, right? More on that in a minute. Me and, uh, or Christina rather, caught my attention as I started searching the podcast ecosystem for restaurant tours. Sichuan House, which is a family-owned business like so many restaurants, was momentarily devastated by the recent pandemic. But she executed a pivot that is working well thus far. 80 plus percent of their pre-pandemic business was dine-in. What to do, what to do, right? Delivery and takeout, of course. Sounds easy and obvious if you've never been in the restaurant business. Christina breaks down the special approach she's taken to delivery service, what she and her team have learned in the process as well. A couple of things that have worked in their favor. Sichuan House had already been invested in technology, and the other, they're vertically integrated with a family-owned Pan-Asian grocery store, which helps immensely with inventory. But a lot of credit goes to Christina. Her unique background, her education, and her how-to-get-it-done approach has arguably been the real secret sauce in their recent success. Christina also shares some personal stuff in this episode, which weaves into the story, uh, and which I loved. It was bold and honest and was very human of her. So back to my involvement in the restaurant business, just to vent publicly. Uh, Myself, along with a few other partners, initially got involved in a franchise that frankly went terribly wrong. Sideways. A dumpster fire, if you will. Then in the midst of rebranding, the damn plague arrived. I'm a, little, I'm a little disappointed in this, yep. But I'm also challenged by it all. I, I don't know if we're going to make it through to the other side, but I'm giving it everything I've got to help make that happen. I really needed this conversation with Christina. It was informative and inspirational for sure. And it's been fun making Christina's acquaintance. I, I hope to dine at her restaurant in San Antonio one day soon, even if it is for delivery. Here's me and Christina Zhao. I was checking out your um, interview on Restaurant Unstoppable. It was uh, quite good. I haven't, I haven't heard the whole thing, and it's so funny. I really wanted to hear a specific part, but I'm going to ask you about what I wanted to hear anyway, so it's all good. <laughs> okay. <That's> good. <laughs> um, yeah, he, the uh, host, Eric, is quite a, uh, he's quite a voice character. I'll have to reach out to him and tell him it's a nice, nice episode. Yeah, he does, he does many, many great episodes. <laughs> that yeah. are on show. an end to come too he's very uh engaging with his audience and it's a lot of good content i listened to a lot of um the podcast when we first started the restaurant oh cool so you were familiar with him before uh ever doing the podcast episode eh? yes yes how nice i have been um meaning to uh, look for a new po- uh, restaurant based podcast i was listening to one for a while. It was pretty good, but um, yeah, it would be fun to check out more of Eric's. Uh, I found myself, my wife and I, in the restaurant business in Panama <laughs> last year, and uh, which which is one of the reasons I've had interest. Uh, well, the main reason I've had interest in it and talking to people and checking out podcasts and stuff. So this will be fun for me. Okay, very cool. So how is that? Uh, how is that endeavor going now? Um, it's been a kind of a train wreck for a couple of reasons. One, uh, th- the original concept was brought by a franchisor who, uh, and that just turned out to not be a, a good match for myself, my wife and our other partners. So we had to separate ourselves from that situation. And, uh, and Panama presents a lot of its own unique challenges with doing business. But, uh, so there were some things there as well. And, um, And then right as we were about to transition uh, brand and menu and all that, the uh, pandemic came raining down really hard. And we've, we were, we ran into a a pretty good roadblock in not being able to move about the country at all. Panama has been under pretty strict quarantine um, 
Where are you based off now? Are you? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm in Panama, in Central America. You're, yep. still, you're still in Panama, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that um, created some problems for us because we were working with a consultant who was helping, going to help us with the menu and some conceptual changes. So, so right. for that and various other reasons, we just put the brakes on it. And uh, but we're <clears throat> we're trying to get moving again. We're talking about doing what we uh, weren't able to do yet remotely because we still can't uh, meet one another based on our distance right. and the, where we the provinces we live in. But uh, right. obviously, takeout and uh, and delivery would be something that, that we'd like to get into. And I personally don't foresee the dine-in experience coming back very soon, and nor do I see it as a terribly um, smart indoor dining to be a terribly um, smart thing to do I anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but... Well, we're making many of those decisions ourselves. Yes. Uh, Texas is opening up. Um, I think that, I, I'm not even following, I should be following, but I think it's at 75% now capacity for dine-in, and we still have yet to open our dining room. People are asking, and we're just like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. And the restaurant and you are based in San Antonio, right? Yes, that's correct. San okay. Antonio, Texas. Okay, I am. Um, I heard Austin come up when you were doing your podcast interview and I thought, I'm pretty sure she's in San Antonio, but I know that you're very close to one another, Austin and San Antonio. So wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did my undergraduate studies in Austin and I lived in Austin for two years after that. So I spent I guess, a total of six, six to seven years in Austin. Mm. I, I saw that um, about your education and I, you know, um, noted that you had studied communications and public relations and looking at the work that you do um i think that your your education experience and and obviously some of the work stuff you've done leading up to your your current endeavors in the restaurant it really shows um in the work that you do and it, it looks like it shows in a, in a really nice way thank you yeah yeah, yeah. It, uh, you get spread out real real thin i'm sure you you understand because you're going through similar things at your restaurant <laughs> yeah and so there, there's it's it is a struggle to put a lot of effort into any one subject matter because there's just so many things going on and then that's the inner struggle i was just listening to um your your uh podcast with there's the gentleman up here Thank you for listening, by the way. <laughs> uh, ben Barely with Thoughtful Leadership and Effective Time Management. Yeah. And he's talking about his blog posts and being uh, consistent as opposed to trying to write a Hail Mary all the time. Um, you know, but it's hard because it's like we don't want to put anything out there that we don't feel comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, um, you know, case in point, I recently got an opportunity to make some contributions to Forbes.com in the, in the independent musician space. And uh, they, they would like, they, uh, they're not real hard on this, but they'd like, you know, a certain number of articles per month. And I, I was just telling my wife last night, I was like, I don't think that's going to happen this first month that I'm doing it. I just, because I want to do, I want to do a good job on them. Yeah. I want to do a good job on them and they want to, you know, they obviously want good material and I needed to do uh, research, which for me, uh, this kind of thing is the best way for me to do um, research is to talk to people. So anyway, <laughs> I know how you feel. So um, a couple of side note questions I have for you out of curiosity. So I gathered that you worked um, because you're near Austin and you worked in the wireless industry. I, I wanted to ask a little bit about that. And if you happen to know Richard McKinnon. Richard McKinnon. Um, or Rich. Name, or Rich. Did, he, did, he, did he was the founder of Mift, right? Am I? Uh, yes, uh, yes. And Less Networks, which was a wireless company, um, uh, which I don't think that was around. Yeah. I am not familiar with him through the wireless business, but I actually did uh, meet him through Mift and was going to help him with some work. But that was way back in the day when I was still a senior in, in college. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And what, where, where in the wireless space did you work? Um, I worked for a um, master agent company called KCI Wireless. Okay. They're based in Houston. And then after, or, and prior to that, I 
worked for a company called Wireless Partners, but they ha- they're no longer in uh, in business. <laughs> and then um, and then after KCI, I was at CCB for a couple of months, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> in the towel for the the wireless side yeah yeah well i i was curious i um found myself in that world i'm trying to remember which came first but uh i think it was a gig with a a company that was trying to do things in the wi-fi space in silicon valley back in around 06 07 and i met rich mckinnon who at that time he had less networks and later on miffed and actually did some work with him um and because of rich he and i joined uh an organization called the Wireless Communications Alliance based out of Silicon Valley. And I've always kind of been connected to those guys. It's an interesting space. So I was just curious. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, I was not on the technology development side. It was more on the um, retail distribution side between B2, on the B2B side, mm-hmm. doing mobile, just teaching resellers how to sell the product and so forth. But it was very cool. Uh, I was, I got to meet some, very interesting people during the process went to CES a couple of times. Um, and I don't think I was what, 21, 22 at the time. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was an exciting space. And I, I guess it still can be. Um, I, I thought it was pretty exciting when I was uh, initially involved in it. So w- one thing I made note to myself about that was inspiring because of what you're doing. And please help me if I'm saying it incorrectly with Szechuan Sesh- House. Uh Uh, is that you didn't actually um, come from the restaurant business per se. I know that your family has been in the restaurant and food business, but I, I find this particularly inspiring. You didn't set out on a, to do a career in the restaurant business, but can you anyway, just talk a little bit about that, not having uh, come from it, as I say, um, or at least not intentionally driving toward it all your life and having landed there now. Sure. Well, my family background, um, my father has a, an Asian grocery store. So in a way, we're vertically integrated for what is, you know, all inventory aspect. But, but other than that, we don't have any experience in the restaurant world. My father had always been encouraged to open up a restaurant because he's, he's a fantastic cook himself. And I think the opportunity came along uh, for him in, in, in a space that's not too far from our, our market space. And at the time, I was kind of in, in the limbo state myself and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I figured I'd move back. To, I was living in Dallas, and I figured I'd move back to San Antonio, um, study to take the GMATs. My mother had just moved to New York to practice psychiatry. And that's kind of how I got into the business. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, it's so funny. You and I have these interesting pa- uh, path crossings. because I'm, I'm from Fort Worth, not too far away from Dallas. And I've spent some time in Austin. No, this guy was in the wireless space. So <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I love the, the verdict vertically integrated um, piece through the grocery store. It kind of gives me some ideas. It's something I kind of, um, since we started the restaurant, (laughs) since we've been trying to start the restaurant, we did actually have it open and running for a while, but um, I have been, you know, constantly thinking of ways, uh, just running ideas in my head and sharing them with my partners about ways that we might do that in the future. So how, how, what are some of the unique, things that that has done for your your business that maybe gives you a leg up uh well it's it's tremendous so one of the things that i not constantly but i sometimes it's easy for me to forget about but i'm so grateful for is that i really don't have a lot to do with the inventory component with the restaurant, which, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a huge component. Sure. And so I've been very fortunate and lucky to not have to have deal with that section of the business for a very long time. Um, recently, and I say recently in the last two years, we've implemented market man uh, to, to help us manage inventory to really help us dial in and with the recipe costing and so far, I mean, so so forth. 
to be inclusive of all the ingredients that we use. I mean, in the traditional Chinese restaurant space, I guess for the lack of a better way to describe it, the, the back of house runs very, very smoothly, very smooth. You don't really have to worry too much about it at all if you have you know, reliable staff. And we are fortunate that we do. Um, but they're, they're also very set in their, their ways. They have things that they've been doing for 10, 20 years, and you just don't mess with it because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it goes, so it's a, it's a catch 22 in both ways because you want to try to um, change old habits and behaviors and modify them as needed to, to improve, make improvements on your business. But you're met with um, objection constantly because that's quote unquote, not how you do it. Like, well, no, you, you have to do it this way. I mean, and that challenge, I don't know if that has a lot to do with vertical integration, but um, it's the way that I see it is it's something that I've inherited Mm -hmm. and I have to deal with it. Like it's a, it's a, there's a lots of pros to it because I don't have to worry about um, where I'm ordering next from as, as silly as that says, (laughs) it sounds. But at the same time, it it comes, I don't know how to explain it. Are you, are you still (laughs) learning? I mean, um, have you um, learned any lessons that have helped you sort of move the needle where <laughs> helping staff change some of their ways to try something that looks like it would be a lot better? Or are you still working on that part? Well, we do. We do. We've made a lot of changes. We've made a, we've made a lot of growth um, in communications throughout the years, too, um, like implementing the way that they place their orders. So a way to illustrate this is, instead of using um, a checklist, I mean, they would literally make a checklist and say, okay, we need rice, we need broccoli, we need chicken, we need just literally just, there's not really a system. It's just a list. And then the market fills it, fills this order. Mm-hmm. But in order for us to, to make sense of things, to, to plug it in, to um, work with our point of sales, like, okay, today we sold 10, 10 portions of green beans. Well, how many, like, how, what are the actual ingredient costs for these green beans? All of these things, like, they have to be um, calculated meticulously. And the program does that for us. But if we don't enter it in in the front end or the back end, then we don't get these numbers. Yeah, sure. And so what change, what tweak did you make to, to help transition from written checklists to getting that stuff entered with the staff's help? Um, well, wait, so it's, it's crucial to have someone who's bilingual on our team because the, a lot of the, uh, interactions are done in both English and Chinese. And so having, having, a we hired someone, uh, and it's, I had an assistant for a while. Now I don't have an assistant. <laughs> so <laughs> now I'm doing it. Um, but it's, it's getting into the routine of doing it on an everyday basis. So I'm still, I'm still struggling a little bit on that note, but it's, not the biggest piece of uh, struggle in, in the business that we have. That's why we're able to be sustainable for so long without having dialed that component in. I think it's important to, to fix these things as we're trying to grow and scale because these are not things that you really want to have to worry about constantly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're making progress. I, I have to um, go ahead and get to this question that is really on my mind and uh, sure. lest, lest I just talk your head off and, and we run out of time, I'll go to it now. But so um, delivery, I want to read a, a couple of things. Um, one of them, uh, I'm not sure if I got it off the side or what, but free delivery on orders of $50 or more to addresses within 25, mile, 25 minutes of the restaurant. That's one thing. Uh-huh. And then another yeah. one was from a... Um, Facebook post that you had, which I know has drawn some attention, but uh, um, you talked about the situation with the pandemic, what mm-hmm. it's, what the, you know, the havoc it's wreaking for everyone. And uh, I encourage anyone who's listening to this is interested to um, see the show notes for a link to this post because it's a, it's much longer than what I'm, I'm about to read, but uh, you wrote in there, uh, gain the returns you deserve for your business and you encourage people to email you and uh, we'll help you put together a step-by-step strategy on implementation. So your your post not only sort of goes through what, what your 
business was going through, what everyone was going through, but it seemed it had this very subtle, um, you know, we want to, we want to fight together with you. So if you need our help, here's, here's Absolutely. how you can reach me. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? And, and, and tell me about the, deli- the, the pivoting that you've done or whatever you've done to make um, delivery and takeout work under the current circumstances. So uh, our restaurant has traditionally been this very experience focused, you know, dine-in model. 82% of our sales were, were from dine-in. And with the mass closing of everything, of course, we're, sh- we're forced to figure out how are we going to sustain. And what really, I mean, a few things that set, up, set us up for success is our heavy integration with technology. Our point of sales was ready to just go online, just like, you know, I mean, it was, it was set up, ready to go. And then we needed to figure out the d- delivery component because we, we got to figure out how to get our product to our customers. And the options at the time were really, you know, your DoorDash, your Uber Eats, uh, Favor, all of the uh, Grubhub, these delivery services that are asking for 20, 30, <clears throat> excuse me, 20 to 30 percent of your margin. And in this food business, you know that we are we're only making 20 percent if we're lucky, if we calculate all of our um, costs and budgets and 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 are very conservative with spending, we can we can hope to get a 20% return. So where am I supposed to find this 20 to 30% to spend on delivery service? Right? It just doesn't, uh, it wasn't making a lot of sense. And so I had, um, I met the app developer of returns a while back and we were in conversation and I had asked him, hey, is there any way that we can utilize this app to deliver food instead of packages? The returns app was originally, um, its core competency is is picking up a product and then dropping it off at uh, a postal store so or a delivery service store. So it covers that first mile of um, outbound shipping logistics. Mm-hmm. So essentially we, 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 had a discussion and then I asked him if we can, is there a way that we can use my employees as your drivers for this app and have them deliver the food for me? I'm happy to go through and utilize the app to to do the dispatch process and so forth. And and that's kind of how that conversation began. And then in the price points that we set on it, um, the app developer was just like, "Well, well, what, what can you, what do you want to pay for this delivery? And so we're able to set our own price points on the back end. So when he asked that question, it was really about what do you want to pay pay them or, or for the for right? What do you want to pay your employees essentially? Uh, okay, okay. Right, mm-hmm. and and then so when we're making this decision on offering delivery services, we're thinking about okay, well, where do I need to deliver to? Where do most of my guests live? Um, what is the wear and tear on the like my employees' vehicles? Um, what what are they needing from us? Like, how do we allow every party to essentially not necessarily win, but be sustainable here? Mm-hmm. And so, all of these factors came into mind. And the reason we put orders or complimentary delivery on orders over fifty dollars within a twenty-five minute radius. Most delivery services, if not all of them, they do not measure um, their delivery area based off of a distance. It's based off of a mileage range. But all miles are not created equally as far as travel time. I personally live about 13 miles away from my restaurant, but it takes me 15 minutes to get there because it's highway to highway. So why would I not serve the clientele that that that's visiting the most doesn't make any sense and so that kind of ruled out a lot of other delivery apps that were that were available and wanted these margins the second part of uh, i mean another component to it is the ability to to employ my own staff as these gig drivers and so when when they're dropping off food to you, it's like, hey, it's not some random person who just picked up food from a restaurant. It's it's this, it's my server who who takes care of me every single time that I go to dine in at the restaurant. 
and um, and we're able to control the 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 entire process of the delivery from the order point up until the drop off point to make sure that we control the, the the process as much as possible. I love that. And so, did you end up developing your own app based on return returns or um, are you we kind of just, licensing what they have? Um, we just, so the, the app is, I, I want to say it's not consumer facing, but it is depending on what you use it for. The app itself is designed to, um, is, is aimed for e-commerce. Let's say you order some product online and let's say it's a, it's a shoe and it doesn't fit correctly. So you want to return it, but you don't have the time to go to the postal store yourself, wait in line, yada, yada. So you, you get on this app and a driver is will show up to your doorstep to pick up this package for you and drop it off and and do the return for you. So we're utilizing so that's that's the app as consumer facing. But for our purposes, we don't send our customers to returns. We use it as the customer ourselves. I'm using it to call a driver essentially and have the driver pick up my package, which is actually my food delivery, and then drop it off, not at the postal store, at an end destination. Um, that's a new uh, update that's coming to the app soon to get rid of the workaround for having it dropped off at a quote-unquote postal store, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but but that's, that's uh, something cool for them, too, that they've been able to make improvements on their app during this pandemic. Very cool. Um, so essentially, we, we we're not we're not we're not licensing the app. We're just paying we're we're paying whatever the price points we designated for the travel distances. I mean, the app, if you look at itself, I don't know. Have you had a chance to download it and kind of play with it? No, no. I, it's the first I've I've heard of it, and we, <laughs> okay. we hear we hear locally. Like I don't know that we could either. Um, so here locally in Panama, we have. Um, probably three different services. One of them is, you know, kind of a hyper local offering and the other one's based out of Panama city. But I have talked to some friends who are um, restaurateurs. I have, well, I'm, we're in a kind of a small community, so I know some of the restaurateurs, but I'm also a musician. And so I played at, uh, played, performed at some of these places as well. So I know them there and they know we have the restaurant, but um, yeah. I've heard some of the same things, you know, the margins are so high. Uh, but the the manager, a new partner we brought on, was looking to just use, utilize all the services we have to see who rises to the top. But it's certainly something that's been in the back of my mind, and my wife's right. talked about it a lot. The margins that we pay there, and there, and I, I've done some um, as we were exploring the options. Like even though I had made the decision at the very beginning to use returns and kind of develop our own, so we didn't develop our own app out of this, but we developed our own process of mm -hmm. how we communicate with our customers of, you know, getting this uh, landing page launched and up and then giving people very, trying to break down instructions to be as easy as possible for people to follow. Step one, you know, place your order online. Step two, if you're in this uh, delivery zone, text us your address and, and, um, and we'll send you the confirmation. And step three, text us where you want to, I actually don't remember if this is correct or not, but step three, text us where, uh, where you want us to set the order down for you for, for contactless delivery. So, um, it's really cool. Yeah. I'm kind of looking at the, uh, website right now and, um, I totally watched the steps, but <laughs> basically, uh, I'm, I may have to buy someone uh, uh, lunch or, or dinner to to um, get some <laughs> get some reconnaissance well, we on your process. We, we did that, so it, it was. I was going through a slew of things. Um, I, I hope that you edit some of this out, but um, when when COVID first hit, because we have this, uh, we have the grocery store too, mm -hmm. and the way that the response for both businesses are just completely different on the restaurant end, we're able to just close our doors literally in the sense, and then stop people from coming in. Right. We can put the food out curbside delivery, yada, yada. But with the market, it's completely different. I mean, this is the grocery store. You can't stop people from really coming in and we don't have the manpower to, to, do the temperature checks and, and to do the sanitization after every single person has touched something. So when everything is, when everything is happening, I was just going back and forth between the restaurant and the market, making sure 
that we were doing as much as we could. And then at, the, at, at that time, you know, PPE was just not available anywhere. You could not get a thermometer for two months. So it was, a, it was very, very hectic and frantic. And then the, that same weekend or that same week is, it just happened to be my assistant's uh, last day. She had put in her two weeks notice prior to the pandemic starting. So I lose my assistant. And then one of my, uh, one of my managers is exposed to COVID because his wife is uh, an ICU nurse at a, has, at a hospital designated to receive COVID patients. So now I am down a manager. Oh, no. <laughs> so between sat, like on Friday, Saturday, it's this Saturday, uh, I'm working at the restaurant all day with my other manager, which is making a list of things. And I make the terrible decision to, to enjoy a few beverages while we're working. We get a lot of work done. But that <laughs> night uh, ends up with me in jail for, <laughs> for, for drinking and driving. Don't do it. It's not good for you. It's oh, not my good goodness. For you. <laughs> well, I want to make for a good conversation. Right? Absolutely. And, and be entertaining. Because uh, this is probably quite entertaining. So, you know, I, 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 I have earned my thug life stripes. I tell my team that. that nice. Not, uh, that was miserable. Um, probably the worst exp- one of my the worst experiences I've ever had in my life. I think they probably do that on purpose to make sure you don't go back there. Um, but as I'm getting, I, I so I go to jail. I get out of jail, and my my manager's just like, "I'm sorry, I had to call your dad. There's just there's just no way. I'm I'm very sorry. There's no way I could have explained to him where his daughter, who's been in and out of the market the last like." 30, 72 hours is just mysteriously disappeared for the next 20. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so my dad comes to pick me up and I'm just, he, he doesn't yell at me actually, surprisingly. I'm, I'm, um, I'm very shocked, but also very grateful. He was very kind and just like, hey, are you okay? And so forth. Then, so the, the, the conversation resumes about how, so this happens March 20, fourth 25th ish that weekend Mm -hmm. and then we start conversations with returns that monday um that following monday and implementing this delivery system and we're we're able to launch it within two days it's it's that quick to implement and and as far as using the app goes now the protocols and procedures we had to kind of fine tune and so forth and during that first week wednesday thursday friday when we launched we did a lot of soft testing like you like you were saying about um testing the product process right (laughs) we did a lot of um we we reached out to a lot of our most loyal patrons and just said hey we're we're trying this uh, delivery program or developing our own delivery program that's the facebook post that you saw too right uh, having to do with that and and just kind of tweaking the process like the message on on the uh the website has actually that that one two three instruction um little post has been tweaked no less than 15 20 times to to make it as concise as simple as possible and then um april 4th so a week later okay so between that time one of my dog i have two dogs my older dog is 13 and he's he had some final issues and he just completely became paralyzed and he, so i've got um this dog who's just i've got to take care of him take him to to therapy have to um feed him cbd droplets and figure out how to help him go to the bathroom and so forth because it's it's i mean i don't have any children and so that kind of was like a taste test of what it might be like to have an infant maybe mm-hmm. possibly and <laughs> <laughs> that is, I'm writing that off for, for a while, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and then uh, I get a phone call on April 4th. This is the, the one week after, Saturday afternoon. We're about a week into returns and, the, uh, sorry, deliveries. And I get a phone call from a friend. And this friend is like, hey, all of us non-essential workers are struggling here. Is there anything you need help with around the house or, you know, things that we can do? Just help a brother out here. And I'm like, okay, well, I have some shelves that I need to be, that, that I need to put up. I need some, like, 
I, I uh, moved into my new home back in August and I'm still putting it together. So while they are installing the shelf, they drill into my fire sprinkler line. Nice. And <laughs> <laughs> You're having a so, hectic week at this point. Yes. And this is all the beginning of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm sitting in front of my computer and, and I've got this, these deliveries that we need to send out and as well as like messages that we're sending out to, to coordinate with our, uh, with our guests. And all I hear is just this explosion and it's like, Oh no. I turn around and I'm like, Oh my oh. gosh. So I call Jess, my manager and, um, and FaceTiming her and I'm just drenched, covered in water. She's like, what is going on? And I'm like, Jess, you got this? Uh, and she's like, yeah, 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 we, we, we've got it. And so I will send you, uh, I'll email you back with a little uh, uh, presentation that we did with, in conjunction with the city of San Antonio uh -huh. about the returns platform. Um, and on there, there's a timeline and it says April 4th, that's when houses team is forced to operate returns on their own and that's why <laughs> that's the, that's the reason for why it happened oh, wow. but that would be amazing yeah i'd love to see that <laughs> i'm getting so just to warn you i'm getting an uh, an auspicious uh alarm and i'm i it should not be happening to me because i have a paid account but i don't know if zoom's trying to tell oh. me something or what or uh anyway if if anything happens uh, don't uh, sit tight i'll be back um no no Wow. Yeah. Tough. So you were having trouble probably paying attention to the pandemic for the first few days. <laughs> oh, and I was literally just been talking to my friends before and uh, we're like, some people, all the things just happen to them. This happens. And I'm like, okay, I take that back. I take it all back. I understand things happen to people and they just happen. And, and I hope that I'm done. I've had, I've had my trifecta of situations happening. Exactly. So, and how's your dog? My dog has now uh, recovered. He's been in therapy, um, and uh, he's he's making a lot of progress. He's walking again. The house is still um, a work in progress. I mean that that in itself is you know, there's a whole insurance claim thing involved and having to select the contractor and who's going to do the work. I mean it, it it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm sorry. It's so funny. I thought of your dog, and I'm like, oh yeah, you didn't just turn the water off, right? You have the aftermath of a situation like that you're dealing with. So, wow. oh right, right. <laughs> so the water is still going, and then the good thing is, so in in my community, uh, there's there's um, there's 14 townhomes, and I happen to live across the courtyard from the builder of the property, and so. Um, since it is the pandemic, everybody's at home. Thank goodness. I'm just drenched. And I, I go across, knock on his door, and I'm just like, ah, oh, uh, water, uh, leak everywhere. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even talk because I can't find the water shut off valve. So I learned where that is. It's on the outside exterior of, of my home, virtually, like essentially on the street. We find that valve and turn it off, and the water is still going. So thank goodness uh, our HOA president is also home and he has the keys to the fire sprinkler room. So we go to the fire sprinkler room and turn the water off and that is how it finally shuts off. But mind you, it's been, it's been spewing for like 20, 30 minutes now. So my entire second floor and first floor of my house are completely <laughs> just, it's bad. Oh All the flooring has come up. Uh, my staircase is, is essentially gone. And so I've just kind of been uh, um, hopping around between here and, and where I'm staying in the evening to keep some sanity. <laughs> well, you're obviously a trooper going through all that and you're still uh, maintaining cheerful mindset, uh, marching on. So good, good for you. Sure. Um, okay. So yeah, thanks for sharing all that about the Ooh, the the, del the delivery the journey, delivery journey, <laughs> yeah, and everything else, yeah, in between. Um, I was also really curious about your philosophies on setting the table. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? So I have not read the book in its entirety. I d I, I came across that book maybe about a year and a year and a half ago. Um, after we had already been in this in in business for 
for three and a half years. Just reverse mathing that. Mm -hmm. And but some of the things that um, he touches on, they tr they're pretty much what we embody and, and value already in taking care of our people. I mean, the, in taking care and people is is in this particular order of hierarchy is your employees and then your patrons and then your um, community and then your vendors and then lastly your investors and and we're in a situation right now where we don't really have investors so that we don't have that necessarily to worry about for this restaurant but i do agree that you know taking care of your people your your customers sorry your your employees and your customers are just so important and when you do that well the rest really just follows i can't really explain it um People it do see sense. that you're genuine mm -hmm. in when we first, I mean, even, even now I still try to make an effort too, but when we first opened more so every single review that came in online, even though we didn't have our website up and not a huge social media presence, I did take the time to respond to every single comment that was made, um, whether it was thanking them for, for sharing their experience or to really address some of the things that people brought up. Because a lot of times people just want to be heard. People want to know that you, you care about yeah, absolutely. Um, what they're thinking. And, and you know, we go back to, I think about Richard McKinnon and MIFT when he's like, well, don't, don't get mad, uh, get MIFT, use MIFT to send your businesses feedback and, and so forth. Um, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, it just, it kind of never caught on. I don't know if it has yet, but it, I don't think it has caught on in use for mainstream. Yeah. But but I think that it, I mean, they, they, in the end, they work. The review sites and so forth, they're important. They give feedback. They're, they're for the most part, they're honest. And, it, and you have to do, there's no way you can control that, right? You just have to respond to it and, and respond in a proactive way. Absolutely. Um, and I think with like MIFT, uh, it, it was fighting against a really um, embedded, pervasive culture where pe people want to air their grievances in public these days. Right. That's right. So. I mean, there, there's a lot of things to be considered when 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 you're uh, looking at all of these technology platforms, and there are so many that we look at. I mean, even with sorry, like jumping back into um, some of the. Uh, options for delivery service with Grubhub and Uber Eats and, and all those things, like the, the margins that they're asking for, it's not necessarily unreasonable because of what they bring to the table. Like there, it's not just the 20, 30% for the delivery, it is for the exposure um, that you get when you're on their platform. But to call it a 20 to 30% commission for the delivery, it's very misleading. What you we have to wrap your mind around is is that these are advertising costs this is a part of your marketing cost yeah yeah it's a good way to look at it and i'm glad i asked that although the the title in and of itself of the book and and i, I really <laughs> i have not read the book i heard about it in your conversation with mm -hmm. eric on the podcast and i thought oh mm -hmm. what an interesting idea i mean i was literally thinking of the experience you know the dining experience which i know you became uh, well, well known for, but as sort of a side note right now, as things have shifted to delivery. But thank you for, for sharing all the stuff about taking care of, of people, all the partners and players that are involved in the ecosystem of your business. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important, and uh, sounds like a book I should check out. Um, I, I also, need to make I read the book too. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have it on my audio books. I'll send you a link. <laughs> oh, thank you. We'll make a commitment to each other to to go through it. Um, the other thing I was uh, fascinated by, I believe I also heard you speak to Eric about, was um, your take on uh, menu item naming and the names of the items that you have and kind of having fun with that. It's This is something that um, my wife and I have looked at for the restaurant, but I'm real curious to hear about your uh, approach. So... Um... I think that, that th those are the times in your business that you get to have a little bit more cre creative freedom mm -hmm. and, and really get to be whimsical if you, if you so choose to. But um, I, don't, I think it's more apparent, especially with uh, ethnic restaurants, 
more so than with um, American restaurants. Although maybe I should take that back. I think the the better way to is to look at it via like a cocktail. The cocktails, the names are are always not necessarily related to the ingredients that are in there. Mm-hmm. But over time, people have known like what's in it. Like uh, uh, you have a Bloody Mary and a Long Island and all of these different drinks. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you, you still have very basic ones like rum and Coke and, and whiskey sours, right? But then you, you have all these other names that are out there where people just know what they are. Well, how did that happen? So it was something that just was going through my mind at the time, we, we were doing a, a menu refresh mm-hmm. sometime last year. And, and a part of this menu refresh, uh, well, not a part of it, but in the same time, we were also onboarding a lot of new staff. And since our restaurant is a, a more of ethnic cuisine, the, the items are not as easy to learn for someone who maybe is not super, super hyper into food, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Uh, because like, we, I think I heard you talk about this, that in um, Sichuan cuisine or in certain Asian cuisines, you'll look at a menu item traditionally and they're like, mm-hmm. I have no idea what that is. Show me a description. <laughs> you know, they read through the description. So you are, are you, with your approach, are you trying to give it a more memorable um, name, something they can identify with what the dish is yeah. actually about? <laughs> And so, like, for example, one of the names of our uh, soups is Tom Yum's Cousin Twice Removed. So what this, what this <laughs> name is, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that people do not, the, the original name of this dish is Fish and Hot and Tangy Soup, which does not really sound that appealing. Boring. <laughs> um, but it does describe what it is. It's It'll, it's a white fish and it's in a, in, in a soup that in a broth that's a little bit spicy and it's a little bit tangy yeah. and it has vermicelli noodles in it and it has mushrooms and or shiitake mushrooms in it. And so we, we write the original menu will say fish and hot and tangy soup. And then underneath it, you have the ingredients like vermicelli noodles, shiitake mushrooms, um, uh, uh, basa fish fillet and so forth. And, and then pickled mustard green. But people don't, what I find is people don't read it. My staff doesn't even read it. Like when, when I ask them, hey, what's in this soup? They're like, uh, I'm like, are you kidding? It's, it's written right there in front of you. This is what's in it. Or, you know, some people will say, oh, I didn't know that it had mushrooms in it. It's like, well, it was in there, but what, you want, what do you want me to do? Okay, you're the guest. You're right. I'm sorry this has mushrooms in it. Parentheses, even though it says it has mushrooms in it. Let me take this off of your table and get you something that you would like instead. My apology. I mean, that's kind of what we have to do. Um, but when then you have a name like Tom Yum's cousin twice removed, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm hoping my bet is that they're like, what is this? Well, let me actually take a look into the ingredients. What is in here? And of course, the name is inspired by that because it tastes, it has that tanginess to it, and it's a seafood based broth. And I'm hoping that people who have had Tom Yum can relate to that flavor. (laughs) So um, the idea then is to draw them in to familiarize themselves with the dish by the intrigue of the name? Right, right. We have another dish um, called uh, Forbidden Dreams of the, or Tender Dreams of the Forbidden Palace. (laughs) I love it. And that is, the original name of that is uh, the Beijing pork tenderloins with steamed buns. And the Chinese name for that is Jingjiang Zhou Si. Jing is the Jing in Beijing. Mm-hmm. Jiang is referring to a sauce. And so it's like a Beijing style pork tenderloin and it's served with steamed buns. That's literally, that's the name. It's very basic. Um, and so it's like, well, that one's an easy one to remember. And, and people, people do really like that dish so it's not that they have trouble remembering it but let's make it a little bit more playful since they're they're served with the steam buns those buns look like fluffy pillows to me and then since we're talking about beijing the the capital of the of the country and where the forbidden palace used to be well okay well let's just name it the tender dreams of the forbidden palace and that refers to the pork tenderloin i like it well cool I, I think it's a great approach. We, um, 
I was curious about it, um, obviously from the creativity aspect. And then I was like, ah, me and Sammy, my wife have been talked about doing this literally with the cocktail menu. But of course we think, you know, how can we do that with the menu for us? It's a little challenging here because, so I'm a, you know, kind of intermediate Spanish speaker. Uh, my okay. wife's, my wife's learning. Um, and we have a, a Panamanian partner and a partner who is from Costa Rica. So their Spanish is great, but one of us mm -hmm. among us has a real good handle on Panamanian culture. So it's always a, a risk for us. We have to figure out, you know, how can we make it work for an English audience and a Panamanian right. audience? But uh, okay. anyway, we'll have fun, I'm sure. Um, a lot of people, and, and, and now that you've mentioned that, there are other Russian stuff that do it. Uh, Torchy's Tacos is, mm -hmm. a, is a great example. Mm -hmm. cause they have, their taco names are like the Republican, the Democrat, and, and so forth. And, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> love it. Uh, Christina, where do you, or I'm not sure if it's a, best to ask where, but maybe just um, give me your thoughts on it. Uh, I wanted to ask where, where have you found your industry mentors or life mentors and c industry camaraderie? And if maybe that's, that's not the best question, uh, maybe just share with me what it's been like to um, be in the restaurant industry in terms of finding mentors and establishing camaraderie, which it seems you have? Um, it's a great question. I think I've been very fortunate to be in San Antonio where uh, just a few years ago, we, we were a designated uh, UNESCO city of gastronomy. The restaurant community here is very close knit and you know, people, I mean, it kind of, went hand in hand in our restaurant being discovered by the by our local community and it it kind of became a place for other chefs to eat in town and so i met a lot of people that way and all of the times when they come in they're like hey we see what you're doing we know it's hard work if you ever need anything please reach out i'm happy to help and you know growing up we hear that all the time and and um, a lot of times there's a lot of caution in approaching people for help. It's like, really, do they really want to help you? Um, <laughs> what's it, like what's in it for them? You know, you hear that the, the restaurant industry is really cutthroat and so forth, but, um, but you got to take that leap of faith and, you know, uh, and, and trust in that people do have, the best intentions in mind, um, go into it with an open mind, go into it without any expectations, but just to, just to uh, reach out to your community and, and like say hello back. It's like your community is saying hi to you and you have to take that first step in saying hello back. And all of the mentorships and relationships have really just started from that note of saying, okay, well, nice to meet you. Before I ask you for help, let me get to know you a little bit more. What's your story? Tell me about how you got into the restaurant business. It's kind of, kind of like what, um, what you're doing, um, asking questions to different entrepreneurs. And same thing as what uh, Eric's doing with the Restaurant Unstoppable podcast. We found that, um, that people really do want to help each other out. And it's, it's really beautiful. And I think that uh, in the true spirit of hospitality, like you'd be hard pressed to find someone who is not of that mindset. Um, I'd be very cautious to work with anybody who is not of that mindset because we're, we're in the hospitality business after all. Yeah, it it's would our, be very anti. job to take care of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would be very anti-hospitality. <laughs> anti-hospitable. Well, Christina. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for um, joining me and for answering all my, my self-serving questions. And I hope that actually a lot of the stuff that we talked about, I know it will be helpful to others and inspiring to others. And I have to tell you before we go that um, I love your Instagram, <laughs> both of them actually, but I was um, actually speaking with a, um, a consultant that's been helped, did a social media and web presence audit for me recently. And uh, mm -hmm. I was like, you have to look at, this uh, woman's Instagram, these, uh, I mean, I've seen it before, but I love the way that you have done the collages on there, <laughs> on yours. Oh, and uh, so she, yeah, we were checking it out yesterday afternoon. And um, anyway, it's been uh, really very, very bare. I need to put more uh, 
prime into it. But that's a part of the, the internal struggle that you're talking about before is like, I don't want to put this out because it's not ready yet. And I don't know what to put. Yet. <laughs> well, it's fair. You said, and you had a, you set a high, um, high bar for yourself based on the content that's there. But I did notice I'm like, Oh, there's not that much here. But boy, what what is here is, is really fun. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that you find um, time and inspiration for it soon. And uh, man, it's been great talking with you. I hope to stay in touch. Sure, thank you. I appreciate it. You got it. I'll talk to you again soon. This episode was powered by ConvertKit. More than just an email marketing company, ConvertKit is focused on landing pages too, giving beginner creators everything they need to start building an email list. I've been using ConvertKit since early 2016. Their new free plan allows creators to make unlimited landing pages and forms. You can choose from multiple templates, add personalization, add design, include an incentive email, create a thank you page, manage subscribers, and send broadcast emails. The support and educational resources at ConvertKit are top-notch, and that is important to me. It should be to you. To learn how ConvertKit can help you connect with your audience so that you can make a living doing the work that you love, go to morningtempo.com forward slash convert or the show notes for this episode. Thanks again for listening. This podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. To learn about the different ways that you can support the podcast, visit morningtempo.com forward slash crowd sponsor. There you can also join the Morning Tempo email list for insiders who want to know what I'm learning from the business owners and entrepreneurs that I speak with and work with, including those you hear on this podcast. Morning Tempo insiders get an occasional email from me with business insights, recommendations, hacks, and anything else I come across that could help you in your creative entrepreneurial journey. And it's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe wherever you listen to your favorites. With a whole lot of love to my good friend and former bandmate, Frank Salazar, who wrote and performed the Morning Tempo podcast theme song. Frank, you rock. Ciao for now. <laughs>